Section 11 of State of the Union Addresses, 1837 to 1844. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. John Tyler, December 7, 1841, Part 2. From the report of the Secretary of the Treasury, you will be informed of the condition of the finances. The balance in the Treasury on the 1st of January last, as stated in the report of the Secretary of the Treasury submitted to Congress at the extra session, was $987,345.03. The receipts into the Treasury during the first three quarters of this year from all sources amount to twenty-three million four hundred and sixty seven thousand seventy two dollars and fifty two cents the estimated receipts for the fourth quarter amount to six million nine hundred and forty three thousand ninety five dollars and twenty five cents amounting to thirty million four hundred and ten thousand one hundred and sixty seven dollars and seventy seven cents and making with the balance in the treasury on the first of january last thirty one million three hundred and ninety seven thousand five hundred and twelve dollars and eighty cents the expenditures for the first three quarters of this year amount to twenty four million seven hundred and thirty four thousand three hundred and forty six dollars and ninety seven cents the expenditures for the fourth quarter as estimated will amount to seven million two hundred and ninety thousand seven hundred and twenty three dollars and seventy three cents thus making a total of thirty two million twenty five thousand seventy dollars and seventy cents and leaving a deficit to be provided for on the first of january next of about six hundred and twenty seven thousand five hundred and fifty seven dollars ninety cents of the loan of twelve million dollars which was authorized by congress at its late session only five million four hundred and thirty two thousand seven hundred and twenty six dollars and eighty eight cents have been negotiated the shortness of time which it had to run has presented no inconsiderable impediment in the way of its being taken by capitalists at home while the same cause would have operated with much greater force in the foreign market for that reason the foreign market has not been resorted to and it is now submitted whether it would not be advisable to amend the law by making what remains undisposed of payable at a more distant day should it be necessary in any view that congress may take of the subject to revise the existing tariff of duties i beg leave to say that in the performance of that most delicate operation moderate counsels would seem to be the wisest the government under which it is our happiness to live owes its existence to the spirit of compromise which prevailed among its framers jarring and discordant opinions could only have been reconciled by that noble spirit of patriotism which prompted conciliation and resulted in harmony in the same spirit the compromise bill as it is commonly called was adopted at the session of eighteen thirty three while the people of no portion of the union will ever hesitate to pay all necessary taxes for the support of government yet an innate repugnance exists to the imposition of burdens not really necessary for that object in imposing duties however for the purposes of revenue a right to discriminate as to the articles on which the duty shall be laid as well as the amount necessarily and most properly exists otherwise the government would be placed in the condition of having to levy the same duties upon all articles the productive as well as the unproductive the slightest duty upon some might have the effect of causing their importation to cease whereas others entering extensively into the consumption of the country might bear the heaviest without any sensible diminution in the amount imported so also the government may be justified 
in so discriminating by reference to other considerations of domestic policy connected with our manufacturers so long as the duties shall be laid with distinct reference to the wants of the treasury no well-rounded objection can exist against them it might be esteemed desirable that no such augmentation of the taxes should take place as would have the effect of annulling the land proceeds distribution act of the last session which act is declared to be inoperative the moment the duties are increased beyond twenty per cent the maximum rate established by the compromise act some of the provisions of the compromise act which will go into effect on the thirtieth day of june next may however be found exceedingly inconvenient in practice under any regulations that congress may adopt i refer more particularly to that relating to the home valuation a difference in value of the same articles to some extent will necessarily exist at different ports but that is altogether insignificant when compared with the conflicts in valuation which are likely to arise from the differences of opinion among the numerous appraisers of merchandise in many instances the estimates of value must be conjectural and thus as many different rates of value may be established as there are appraisers these differences in valuation may also be increased by the inclinations which without the slightest imputation of their honesty may arise on the part of the appraisers in favor of their respective ports of entry i recommend this whole subject to the consideration of congress with a single additional remark certainty and permanency in any system of governmental policy are in all respects eminently desirable but more particularly is this true in all that affects trade and commerce the operations of which depend much more on the certainty of their returns and calculations which embrace distant periods of time than on high bounties or duties which are liable to constant fluctuations at your last session i invited your attention to the condition of the currency and exchanges and urged the necessity of adopting such measures as were consistent with the constitutional competency of the government in order to correct the unsoundness of the one and as far as practicable the inequalities of the other no country can be in the enjoyment of its full measure of prosperity without the presence of a medium of exchange approximating to uniformity of value what is necessary as between the different nations of the earth is also important as between the inhabitants of different parts of the same country with the first the precious metals constitute the chief medium of circulation and such also would be the case as to the last but for inventions comparatively modern which have furnished in place of gold and silver a paper circulation i do not propose to enter into a comparative analysis of the merits of the two systems such belonged more properly to the period of the introduction of the paper system the speculative philosopher might find inducements to prosecute the inquiry but his researches could only lead him to conclude that the paper system had probably better never have been introduced and that society might have been much happier without it the practical statesman has a very different task to perform he has to look at things as they are to take them as he finds them to supply deficiencies and to prune excesses as far as in him lies the task of furnishing a corrective for derangements of the paper medium with us is almost inexpressibly great the power exerted by the states to charter banking corporations and which have been carried to a great excess has filled the country with in most of the states an irredeemable paper medium is an evil which in some way or other requires a corrective 
the rates at which bills of exchange are negotiated between different parts of the country furnish an index of the value of the local substitute for gold and silver which is in many parts so far depreciated as not to be received except at a large discount in payment of debts or in the purchase of produce it could earnestly be desired that every bank not possessing the means of resumption should follow the example of the late united states bank of pennsylvania and go into liquidation rather than by refusing to do so to continue embarrassments in the way of solvent institutions thereby augmenting the difficulties incident to the present condition of things whether this government with due regard to the rights of the states has any power to constrain the banks either to resume specie payments or to force them into liquidation is an inquiry which will not fail to claim your consideration in view of the great advantages which are allowed the corporators not among the least of which is the authority contained in most of their charters to make loans to three times the amount of their capital thereby often deriving three times as much interest on the same amount of money as any individual is permitted by law to receive no sufficient apology can be urged for a long continued suspension of specie payments such suspension is productive of the greatest detriment to the public by expelling from circulation the precious metals and seriously hazarding the success of any effort that this government can make to increase commercial facilities and to advance the public interests this is the more to be regretted and the indispensable necessity for a sound currency becomes the more manifest when we reflect on the vast amount of the internal commerce of the country of this we have no statistics nor just data for forming adequate opinions but there can be no doubt but that the amount of transportation coastwise by sea and the transportation inland by railroads and canals and by steamboats and other modes of conveyance over the surface of our vast rivers and immense lakes and the value of property carried and interchanged by these means form a general aggregate to which the foreign commerce of the country large as it is makes but a distant approach in the absence of any controlling power over this subject which by forcing a general resumption of specie payments would at once have the effect of restoring a sound medium of exchange and would leave to the country but little to desire what measure of relief falling within the limits of our constitutional competency does it become this government to adopt it was my painful duty at your last session under the weight of most solemn obligations to differ with congress on the measures which it proposed for my approval and which it doubtless regarded as corrective of existing evils subsequent reflection and events since occurring have only served to confirm me in the opinions then entertained and frankly expressed i must be permitted to add that no scheme of governmental policy unaided by individual exertions can be available for ameliorating the present condition of things commercial modes of exchange and a good currency are but the necessary means of commerce and intercourse not the direct productive sources of wealth wealth can only be accumulated by the earnings of industry and the savings of frugality and nothing can be more ill-judged than to look to facilities in borrowing or to a redundant circulation for the power of discharging pecuniary obligations the country is full of resources and the people full of energy and the great and permanent remedy for present embarrassments must be sought in industry economy the observance of good faith and the favorable influence of time in pursuance of a pledge given to you in my last message to congress which pledge i urge as an apology for adventuring to present you the details of any plan the secretary of the treasury will be ready to submit to you should you require it a plan of finance 
which, while it throws around the public treasure reasonable guards for its protection, and rests on powers acknowledged in practice to exist from the origin of the government, will at the same time furnish to the country a sound paper medium and afford all reasonable facilities for regulating the exchanges. When submitted, you will perceive in it a plan amendatory of the existing laws in relation to the Treasury Department subordinate in all respects to the will of Congress directly and the will of the people indirectly, self-sustaining should it be found in practice to realize its promises in theory and repealable at the pleasure of Congress. It proposes by effectual restraints and by invoking the true spirit of our institutions to separate the purse from the sword, or more properly to speak, denies any other control to the President over the agents who may be selected to carry it into execution, but what may be indispensably necessary to secure the fidelity of such agents, and by wise regulations keeps plainly apart from each other private and public funds. It contemplates the establishment of a board of control at the seat of government with agencies at prominent commercial points, or wherever else Congress shall direct, for the safekeeping and disbursement of the public monies, and a substitution at the option of the public creditor of treasury notes in lieu of gold and silver. It proposes to limit the issues to an amount not to exceed fifteen million dollars without the express sanction of the legislative power it also authorizes the receipt of individual deposits of gold and silver to a limited amount and the granting certificates of deposit divided into such sums as may be called for by the depositors it proceeds a step further and authorizes the purchase and sale of domestic bills and drafts resting on a real and substantial basis payable at sight or having but a short time to run and drawn on places not less than one hundred miles apart which authority except in so far as may be necessary for government purposes exclusively is only to be exerted upon the express condition that its exercise shall not be prohibited by the state in which the agency is situated in order to cover the expenses incident to the plan it will be authorized to receive moderate premiums for certificates issued on deposits and on bills bought and sold and thus as far as its dealings extend to furnish facilities to commercial intercourse at the lowest possible rates and to subduct from the earnings of industry the least possible sum it uses the state banks at a distance from the agencies as auxiliaries without imparting any power to trade in its name it is subject to such guards and restraints as have appeared to be necessary it is the creature of law and exists only at the pleasure of the legislature it is made to rest on an actual specie basis in order to redeem the notes at the places of issue produces no dangerous redundancy of circulation affords no temptation to speculation is attended by no inflation of prices is equitable in its operation makes the treasury notes which it may use along with the certificates of deposit and the notes of specie paying banks convertible at the place where collected receivable in payment of government dues and without violating any principle of the constitution affords the government and the people such facilities as are called for by the wants of both such it has appeared to me are its recommendations and in view of them it will be submitted whenever you may require it to your consideration i am not able to perceive that any fair and candid objection can be urged against the plan the principal outlines of which i have thus presented i cannot doubt but that the notes which it proposes to furnish at the voluntary option of the public creditor issued in lieu of the revenue and its certificates of deposit will be maintained at an equality with the gold and silver everywhere they are redeemable in gold and silver on demand at the places of issue 
they are receivable everywhere in payment of government dues the treasury notes are limited to an amount of one-fourth less than the estimated annual receipts of the treasury and in addition they rest upon the faith of the government for their redemption if all these assurances are not sufficient to make them available then the idea as it seems to me of furnishing a sound paper medium of exchange may be entirely abandoned if a fear be indulged that the government may be tempted to run into excess in its issues at any future day it seems to me that no such apprehension can reasonably entertain until all confidence in the representatives of the states and of the people as well as of the people themselves shall be lost the weightiest considerations of policy require that the restraints now proposed to be thrown around the measure should not for light causes be removed to argue against any proposed plan its liability to possible abuse is to reject every expedient since everything dependent on human action is liable to abuse fifteen millions of treasury notes may be issued as the maximum but a discretionary power is to be given to the board of control under that sum and every consideration will unite in leading them to feel their way with caution for the first eight years of the existence of the late bank of the united states its circulation barely exceeded four million and for five of its most prosperous years it was about equal to sixteen million furthermore the authority given to receive private deposits to a limited amount and to issue certificates in such sums as may be called for by the depositors may so far fill up the channels of circulation as greatly to diminish the necessity of any considerable issue of treasury notes a restraint upon the amount of private deposits has seemed to be indispensably necessary from an apprehension thought to be well founded that in any emergency of trade confidence might be so far shaken in the banks as to induce a withdrawal from them of private deposits with a view to ensure their unquestionable safety when deposited with the government which might prove eminently disastrous to the state banks is it objected that it is proposed to authorize the agencies to deal in bills of exchange it is answered that such dealings are to be carried on at the lowest possible premium are made to rest on an unquestionably sound basis are designed to reimburse merely the expenses which would otherwise devolve upon the treasury and are in strict subordination to the decision of the supreme court in the case of the bank of augusta against earl and other reported cases and thereby avoids all conflict with state jurisdiction which i hold to be indispensably requisite it leaves the banking privileges of the state without interference looks to the treasury and the union and while furnishing every facility to the first is careful of the interests of the last but above all it is created by law is amenable by law and is repealable by law and wedded as i am to no theory but looking solely to the advancement of the public good i shall be among the very first to urge its repeal if it be found not to subserve the purposes and objects for which it may be created nor will the plan be submitted in any overweening confidence in the sufficiency of my own judgment but with much greater reliance on the wisdom and patriotism of congress i cannot abandon this subject without urging upon you in the most emphatic manner whatever may be your action on the suggestions which i have felt it to be my duty to submit to relieve the chief executive magistrate by any and all constitutional means from a controlling power over the public treasury if in the plan proposed should you deem it worthy of your consideration that separation is not as complete as you may desire you will doubtless amend it in that particular 
for myself i disclaim all desire to have any control over the public monies other than what is indispensably necessary to execute the laws which you may pass nor can i fail to advert in this connection to the debts which many of the states of the union have contracted abroad and under which they continue to labor that indebtedness amounts to a sum not less than two hundred million dollars and which has been retributed to them for the most part in works of internal improvement which are destined to prove of vast importance in ultimately advancing their prosperity and wealth for the debts thus contracted the states are alone responsible i can do not more than express the belief that each state will feel itself bound by every consideration of honor as well as of interest to meet its engagements with punctuality the failure however of any one state to do so should in no degree affect the credit of the rest and the foreign capitalist will have no just cause to experience alarm as to all the other state stocks because any one or more of the states may neglect to provide with punctuality the means of redeeming their engagements even such states should there be any considering the great rapidity with which their resources are developing themselves will not fail to have the means at no very distant day to redeem their obligations to the utmost farthing nor will i doubt but that in view of that honorable conduct which has evermore governed the states and the people of the union they will each and all resort to every legitimate expedient before they will forego a faithful compliance with their obligations from the report of the secretary of war and other reports accompanying it you will be informed of the progress which has been made in the fortifications designed for the protection of our principal cities roadsteads and inland frontier during the present year together with their true state and condition they will be prosecuted to completion with all the expedition which the means placed by congress at the disposal of the executive will allow i recommend particularly to your consideration that portion of the secretary's report which proposes the establishment of a chain of military posts from council bluffs to some point on the pacific ocean within our limits the benefit thereby destined to accrue to our citizens engaged in the fur trade over that wilderness region added to the importance of cultivating friendly relations with savage tribes inhabiting it and at the same time of giving protection to our frontier settlements and of establishing the means of safe intercourse between the american settlements at the mouth of the columbia river and those on this side of the rocky mountains would seem to suggest the importance of carrying into effect the recommendations upon this head with as little delay as may be practicable the report of the secretary of the navy will place you in possession of the present condition of that important arm of the national defense every effort will be made to add to its efficiency and i cannot too strongly urge upon you liberal appropriations to that branch of the public service inducements of the weightiest character exist for the adoption of this course of policy our extended and otherwise exposed maritime frontier calls for protection to the furnishing of which an efficient naval force is indispensable we look to no foreign conquests nor do we propose to enter into competition with any other nation for supremacy on the ocean but it is due not only to the honor but to the security of the people of the united states that no nation should be permitted to invade our waters at pleasure and subject our towns and villages to conflagration or pillage economy in all branches of the public service is due from all the public agents to the people but parsimony alone would suggest the withholding of the necessary means for the protection of our domestic firesides from invasion and our national honor 
from disgrace. I would most earnestly recommend to Congress to abstain from all appropriations for objects not absolutely necessary, but I take upon myself, without a moment of hesitancy, all the responsibility of recommending the increase and prompt equipment of that gallant navy, which has lighted up every sea with its victories and spread an imperishable glory over the country. The report of the Postmaster General will claim your particular attention not only because of the valuable suggestions which it contains, but because of the great importance which at all times attaches to that interesting branch of the public service. The increased expense of transporting the mail along the principal routes necessarily claims the public attention, and has awakened a corresponding solicitude on the part of the government. The transmission of the mail must keep pace with those facilities of intercommunication which are every day becoming greater through the building of railroads and the application of steam power, but it cannot be disguised that in order to do so the post office department is subjected to heavy exactions. The lines of communication between distant parts of the Union are to a great extent occupied by railroads, which, in the nature of things, possesses a complete monopoly, and the department is therefore liable to heavy and unreasonable charges. This evil is destined to great increase in future, and some timely measure may become necessary to guard against it. I feel it my duty to bring under your consideration a practice which has grown up in the administration of the government, and which I am deeply convinced ought to be corrected. I allude to the exercise of the power which usage, rather than reason, has vested in the presidents of removing incumbents from office in order to substitute others more in favor with the dominant party. My own conduct in this respect, has been governed by a conscientious purpose to exercise the removing power only in cases of unfaithfulness or inability, or in those in which its exercise appeared necessary in order to discountenance and suppress that spirit of active partisanship on the part of holders of office, which not only withdraws them from the steady and impartial discharge of their official duties, but exerts an undue and injurious influence over elections and degrades the character of the government itself, inasmuch as it exhibits the chief magistrate as being a party through his agents in the secret plots or open workings of political parties. In respect to the exercise of this power, nothing should be left to discretion, which may safely be regulated by law. And it is of high importance to restrain as far as possible the stimulus of personal interests in public elections. Considering the great increase which has been made in public offices in the last quarter of a century, and the probability of further increase, we incur the hazard of witnessing violent political contests, directed too often to the single object of retaining office by those who are in or obtaining it by those who are out. Under the influence of these convictions, I shall cordially concur in any constitutional measure for regulating and by regulating restraining the power of removal. I suggest, for your consideration, the propriety of making without further delay some specific application of the funds derived under the will of Mr. Smithson of England for the diffusion of knowledge, and which have heretofore been vested in public stocks until such time as Congress should think proper to give them a specific direction. Nor will you, I feel confident, permit any abatement of the principle of the legacy to be made, should it turn out that the stocks in which the investments have been made have undergone a depreciation. In conclusion, I commend to your care the interests of this district, for which, 
you are the exclusive legislators considering that this city is the residence of the government and for a large part of the year of congress and considering also the great cost of the public buildings and the propriety of affording them at all times careful protection it seems not unreasonable that congress should contribute toward the expense of an efficient police end of section eleven section twelve of state of the union addresses eighteen thirty seven to eighteen forty four this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org state of the union address john tyler december sixth eighteen forty two part one to the senate and house of representatives of the united states we have continued reason to express our profound gratitude to the great creator of all things for numberless benefits conferred upon us as a people blessed with genial seasons the husbandman has his garners filled with abundance and the necessaries of life not to speak of its luxuries abound in every direction while in some other nations steady and industrious labor can hardly find the means of subsistence the greatest evil which we have to encounter is a surplus of production beyond the home demand which seeks and with difficulty finds a partial market in other regions the health of the country with partial exceptions has for the past year been well preserved and under their free and wise institutions the united states are rapidly advancing toward the consummation of the high density which an overruling providence seems to have marked out for them exempt from domestic convulsion and at peace with all the world we are left free to consult as to the best means of securing and advancing the happiness of the people such are the circumstances under which you now assemble in your respective chambers and which should lead us to unite in praise and thanksgiving to the great being who made us and who preserves us as a nation i congratulate you fellow-citizens on the happy change in the aspect of our foreign affairs since my last annual message causes of complaint at that time existed between the united states and great britain which attended by irritating circumstances threatened most seriously the public peace the difficulty of adjusting amicably the questions at issue between the two countries was in no small degree augmented by the lapse of time since they had their origin the opinions entertained by the executive on several of the leading topics in dispute were frankly set forth in the message at the opening of your late session the appointment of a special minister by great britain to the united states with power to negotiate upon most of the points of difference indicated a desire on her part amicably to adjust them and that minister was met by the executive in the same spirit which had dictated his mission the treaty consequent thereon having been duly ratified by the two governments a copy together with the correspondence which accompanied it is herewith communicated i trust that whilst you may see in it nothing objectionable it may be the means of preserving for an indefinite period the amicable relations happily existing between the two governments the question of peace or war between the united states and great britain is a question of the deepest interest not only to themselves but to the civilized world since it is scarcely possible that a war could exist between them without endangering the peace of christendom the immediate effect of the treaty upon ourselves will be felt in the security afforded to mercantile enterprise which no longer apprehensive of interruption adventures its speculations in the most distant seas and 
freighted with the diversified productions of every land returns to bless our own there is nothing in the treaty which in the slightest degree compromits the honor or dignity of either nation next to the settlement of the boundary line which must always be a matter of difficulty between states as between individuals the question which seemed to threaten the greatest embarrassment was that connected with the african slave trade by the tenth article of the treaty of ghent it was expressly declared that whereas the traffic in slaves is irreconcilable with the principles of humanity and justice and whereas both his majesty and the united states are desirous of continuing their efforts to promote its entire abolition it is hereby agreed that both the contracting parties shall use their best endeavors to accomplish so desirable an object in the enforcement of the laws and treaty stipulations of great britain a practice had threatened to grow up on the part of its cruisers of subjecting to visitation ships sailing under the american flag which while it seriously involved our maritime rights would subject to vexation a branch of our trade which was daily increasing and which required the fostering care of government and although lord aberdeen in his correspondence with the american envoys at london expressly disclaimed all right to detain an american ship on the high seas even if found with a cargo of slaves on board and restricted the british pretension to a mere claim to visit and inquire yet it could not well be discerned by the executive of the united states how such visit and inquiry could be made without detention on the voyage and consequent interruption of the trade it was regarded as the right of search presented only in a new form and expressed in different words and i therefore felt it to be my duty distinctly to declare in my annual message to congress that no such concession could be made and that the united states had both the will and the ability to enforce their own laws and to protect their flag from being used for purposes wholly forbidden by those laws and obnoxious to the moral censure of the world taking the message as his letter of instructions our then minister at paris felt himself required to assume the same ground in a remonstrance which he felt it to be his duty to present to mr guizot and through him to the king of the french against what has been called the quintuple treaty and his conduct in this respect met with the approval of this government in close conformity with these views the eighth article of the treaty was framed which provides that each nation shall keep afloat in the african seas a force not less than eighty guns to act separately and apart under instruction from their respective governments and for the enforcement of their respective laws and obligations from this it will be seen that the ground assumed in the message has been fully maintained at the same time that the stipulations of the treaty of ghent are to be carried out in good faith by the two countries and that all pretense is removed from interference with our commerce for any purpose whatever by any foreign government while therefore the united states have been standing up for the freedom of the seas they have not thought proper to make that a pretext for avoiding the fulfilment of their treaty stipulations or a ground for giving countenance to a trade reprobated by our laws a similar arrangement by the other great powers could not fail to sweep from the ocean the slave trade without the interpolation of any new principle into the maritime code we may be permitted to hope that the example thus set will be followed by some if not all of them we thereby also afford suitable protection to the fair trader in those seas thus fulfilling at the same time the dictates of a sound policy and complying with the claims of justice and humanity it would have furnished additional cause for congratulation if the treaty could have embraced all subjects calculated in future to lead to a misunderstanding between the two governments 
the territory of the united states commonly called the oregon territory lying on the pacific ocean north of the forty-second degree of latitude to a portion of which great britain lays claim begins to attract the attention of our fellow-citizens and the tide of population which has reclaimed what was so lately an unbroken wilderness in more contiguous regions is preparing to flow over those vast districts which stretch from the rocky mountains to the pacific ocean in advance of the acquirement of individual rights to these lands sound policy dictates that every effort should be resorted to by the two governments to settle their respective claims it became manifest at an early hour of the late negotiations that any attempt for the time being satisfactorily to determine those rights would lead to a protracted discussion which might embrace in its failure other more pressing matters and the executive did not regard it as proper to waive all the advantages of an honorable adjustment of other difficulties of great magnitude and importance because this not so immediately pressing stood in the way although the difficulty referred to may not for several years to come involve the peace of the two countries yet i shall not delay to urge on great britain the importance of its early settlement nor will other matters of commercial importance to the two countries be overlooked and i have good reason to believe that it will comport with the policy of england as it does with that of the united states to seize upon this moment when most of the causes of irritation have passed away to cement the peace and amity of the two countries by wisely removing all grounds of probable future collision with the other powers of europe our relations continue on the most amicable footing treaties now existing with them should be rigidly observed and every opportunity compatible with the interests of the united states should be seized upon to enlarge the basis of commercial intercourse peace with all the world is the true foundation of our policy which can only be rendered permanent by the practice of equal and impartial justice to all our great desire should be to enter only into that rivalry which looks to the general good in the cultivation of the sciences the enlargement of the field for the exercise of the mechanical arts and the spread of commerce that great civilizer to every land and sea carefully abstaining from interference in all questions exclusively referring themselves to the political interests of europe we may be permitted to hope in equal exemption from the interference of european governments in what relates to the states of the american continent on the twenty third of april last the commissioners on the part of the united states under the convention with the mexican republic of the eleventh of april eighteen thirty nine made to the proper department a final report in relation to the proceedings of the commission from this it appears that the total amount awarded to the claimants by the commissioners and the umpire appointed under that convention was two million twenty six thousand seventy nine dollars and sixty eight cents the arbiter having considered that his functions were required by the convention to terminate at the same time with those of the commissioners returned to the board undecided for want of time claims which have been allowed by the american commissioners to the amount of nine hundred and twenty eight thousand six hundred and twenty dollars and eighty eight cents other claims in which the amount sought to be recovered was three million three hundred and thirty six thousand eight hundred and thirty seven dollars and five cents were submitted to the board too late for its consideration the minister of the united states at mexico has been duly authorized to make demand for payment of the awards according to the terms of the convention and the provisions of the act of congress of the twelfth of june eighteen forty he has also been instructed to communicate to that government the expectations of the government of the united states in relation to those claims which were not disposed of according to the provisions of the convention 
and all others of citizens of the united states against the mexican government he has also been furnished with other instructions to be followed by him in case the government of mexico should not find itself in a condition to make present payment of the amount of the awards in specie or its equivalent i am happy to be able to say that information which is esteemed favorable both to a just satisfaction of the awards and a reasonable provision for other claims has been recently received from mr thompson the minister of the united states who has promptly and efficiently executed the instructions of his government in regard to this important subject the citizens of the united states who accompanied the late texan expedition to santa fe and who were wrongfully taken and held as prisoners of war in mexico have all been liberated a correspondence has taken place between the department of state and the mexican minister of foreign affairs under the complaint of mexico that citizens of the united states were permitted to give aid to the inhabitants of texas in the war existing between her and the republic copies of this correspondence are herewith communicated to congress together with copies of letters on the same subject addressed to the diplomatic corps at mexico by the american minister and the mexican secretary of state mexico has thought proper to reciprocate the mission of the united states to that government by accrediting to this a minister of the same rank as that of the representative of the united states in mexico from the circumstances connected with his mission favorable results are anticipated from it it is so obviously for the interest of both countries as neighbors and friends that all just causes of mutual dissatisfaction should be removed that it is to be hoped neither will omit or delay the employment of any practicable and honorable means to accomplish that end the affairs pending between this government and several others of the states of this hemisphere formerly under the dominion of spain have again within the past year been materially obstructed by the military revolutions and conflicts in those countries the ratifications of the treaty between the united states and the republic of ecuador of the thirteenth of june eighteen thirty nine have been exchanged and that instrument has been duly promulgated on the part of this government copies are now communicated to congress with a view to enable that body to make such changes in the laws applicable to our intercourse with that republic as may be deemed requisite provision has been made by the government of chile for the payment of the claim on account of the illegal detention of the brig warrior at coquimbo in eighteen twenty this government has reason to expect that other claims of our citizens against chile will be hastened to a final and satisfactory close the empire of brazil has not been altogether exempt from those convulsions which so constantly afflict the neighboring republics disturbances which recently broke out are however now understood to be quieted but these occurrences by threatening the stability of the governments or by causing incessant and violent changes in them or in the persons who administer them tend greatly to retard provisions for a just indemnity for losses and injuries suffered by individual subjects or citizens of other states the government of the united states will feel it to be its duty however to consent to no delay not unavoidable in making satisfaction for wrongs and injuries sustained by its own citizens many years having in some cases elapsed a decisive and effectual course of proceeding will be demanded of the respective governments against whom claims have been preferred the vexatious harassing and expensive war which so long prevailed with the indian tribes inhabiting the peninsula of florida has happily been terminated whereby our army has been relieved from a service of the most disagreeable character and the treasury from a large expenditure some casual outbreaks may occur 
such as are incident to the close proximity of border settlers and the indians but these as in all other cases may be left to the care of the local authorities aided when occasion may require by the forces of the united states a sufficient number of troops will be maintained in florida so long as the remotest apprehensions of danger shall exist yet their duties will be limited rather to the garrisoning of the necessary posts than to the maintenance of active hostilities it is to be hoped that a territory so long retarded in its growth will now speedily recover from the evils incident to a protracted war exhibiting in the increased amount of its rich productions true evidences of returning wealth and prosperity by the practice of rigid justice toward the numerous indian tribes residing within our territorial limits and the exercise of a parental vigilance over their interests protecting them against fraud and intrusion and at the same time using every proper expedient to introduce among them the arts of civilized life we may fondly hope not only to wean them from their love of war but to inspire them with a love for peace and all its avocations with several of the tribes great progress in civilizing them has already been made the schoolmaster and the missionary are found side by side and the remnants of what were once numerous and powerful nations may yet be preserved as the builders up of a new name for themselves and their posterity the balance in the treasury on the first of january eighteen forty two exclusive of the amount deposited with the states trust funds and indemnities was two hundred and thirty thousand four hundred and eighty three dollars and sixty eight cents the receipts into the treasury during the three first quarters of the present year from all sources amount to twenty six million six hundred and sixteen thousand five hundred and ninety three dollars and seventy eight cents of which more than fourteen millions were received from customs and about one million from the public lands the receipts for the fourth quarter are estimated at nearly eight millions of which four millions are expected from customs and three millions and a half from loans and treasury notes the expenditures of the first three quarters of the present year exceed twenty six millions and those estimated for the fourth quarter amount to about eight millions and it is anticipated there will be a deficiency of half a million on the first of january next but that the amount of outstanding warrants estimated at eight hundred thousand will leave an actual balance of about two hundred and twenty four thousand dollars in the treasury among the expenditures of this year are more than eight millions for the public debt and about six hundred thousand on account of the distribution of the states of the proceeds of sales of the public lands the present tariff of duties was somewhat hastily and hurriedly passed near the close of the late session of congress that it should have defects can therefore be surprising to no one to remedy such defects as may be found to exist in any of its numerous provisions will not fail to claim your serious attention it may well merit inquiry whether the exaction of all duties in cash does not call for the introduction of a system which has proved highly beneficial in countries where it has been adopted i refer to the warehousing system the first and most prominent effect which it would produce would be to protect the market alike against redundant or deficient supplies of foreign fabrics both of which in the long run are injurious as well to the manufacturer as the importer the quantity of goods in store being at all times readily known it would enable the importer with an approach to accuracy to ascertain the actual wants of the market and to regulate himself accordingly if however he should fall into error by importing in excess above the public wants he could readily correct its evils by availing himself of the benefits and advantages 
of the system thus established in the storehouse the goods imported would await the demand of the market and their issues would be governed by the fixed principles of demand and supply thus an approximation would be made to a steadiness and uniformity of price which if attainable would conduce to the decided advantage of mercantile and mechanical operations the apprehension may be well entertained that without something to ameliorate the rigor of cash payments the entire import trade may fall into the hands of a few wealthy capitalists in this country and in europe the small importer who requires all the money he can raise for investments abroad and who can but ill afford to pay the lowest duty would have to subduct in advance a portion of his funds in order to pay the duties and would lose the interest upon the amount thus paid for all the time the goods might remain unsold which might absorb his profits the rich capitalist abroad as well as at home would thus possess after a short time an almost exclusive monopoly of the import trade and laws designed for the benefit of all would thus operate for the benefit of a few a result wholly uncongenial with the spirit of our institutions and anti-republican in all its tendencies the warehousing system would enable the importer to watch the market and to select his own time for offering his goods for sale a profitable portion of the carrying trade in articles entered for the benefit of drawback must also be seriously affected without the adoption of some expedient to relieve the cash system the warehousing system would afford that relief since the carriers would have a safe recourse to the public storehouses and might without advancing the duty reship within some reasonable period to foreign ports a further effect of the measure would be to supersede the system of drawbacks thereby effectually protecting the government against fraud as the right of debenture would not attach to goods after their withdrawal from the public stores in revising the existing tariff of duties should you deem it proper to do so at your present session i can only repeat the suggestions and recommendations which upon several occasions i have heretofore felt it to be my duty to offer to congress the great primary and controlling interest of the american people is union union not only in the mere forms of government forms which may be broken but union rounded in an attachment of states and individuals for each other this union in sentiment and feeling can only be preserved by the adoption of that course of policy which neither giving exclusive benefits to some nor imposing unnecessary burdens upon others shall consult the interests of all by pursuing a course of moderation and thereby seeking to harmonize public opinion and causing the people everywhere to feel and to know that the government is careful of the interests of all alike nor is there any subject in regard to which moderation connected with a wise discrimination is more necessary than in the imposition of duties on imports whether reference be had to revenue the primary object in the imposition of taxes or to the incidents which necessarily flow from their imposition this is entirely true extravagant duties defeat their end in object not only by exciting in the public mind and hostility to the manufacturing interests but by inducing a system of smuggling on an extensive scale and the practice of every manner of fraud upon the revenue which the utmost vigilance of government cannot effectually suppress an opposite course of policy would be attended by results essentially different of which every interest of society and none more than those of the manufacturer would reap important advantages among the most striking of its benefits would be that derived from the general acquiescence of the country in its support and the consequential permanency and stability which would be given to all the operations of industry 
it cannot be too often repeated that no system of legislation can be wise which is fluctuating and uncertain no interest can thrive under it the prudent capitalist will never adventure his capital in manufacturing establishments or in any other leading pursuit of life if there exists a state of uncertainty as to whether the government will repeal to-morrow what it has enacted to-day fitful profits however high if threatened with a ruinous reduction by a vacillating policy on the part of government will scarcely tempt him to trust the money which he has acquired by a life of labour upon the uncertain adventure i therefore in the spirit of conciliation and influenced by no other desire than to rescue the great interests of the country from the vortex of political contention and in the discharge of the high and solemn duties of the place which i now occupy recommend moderate duties imposed with a wise discrimination as to their several objects as being not only most likely to be durable but most advantageous to every interest of society End of section 12. Section 13 of State of the Union Addresses, 1837 to 1844. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. State of the Union Address, John Tyler. December 6, 1842, Part 2. The report of the Secretary of the War Department exhibits a very full and satisfactory account of the various and important interests committed to the charge of that officer. It is particularly gratifying to find that the expenditures for the military service are greatly reduced in amount that a strict system of economy has been introduced into the service and the abuses of past years greatly reformed the fortifications on our maritime frontier have been prosecuted with much vigor and at many points our defenses are in a very considerable state of forwardness the suggestions in reference to the establishment of means of communication with our territories on the pacific and to the surveys so essential to a knowledge of the resources of the intermediate country are entitled to the most favorable consideration while i would propose nothing inconsistent with friendly negotiations to settle the extent of our claims in that region yet a prudent forecast points out the necessity of such measures as may enable us to maintain our rights the arrangements made for preserving our neutral relations on the boundary between us and texas and keeping in check the indians in that quarter will be maintained so long as circumstances may require for several years angry contentions have grown out of the disposition directed by law to be made of the mineral lands held by the government in several of the states the government is constituted the landlord and the citizens of the states wherein lie the lands are its tenants the relation is an unwise one and it would be much more conducive of the public interest that a sale of the lands should be made than that they should remain in their present condition the supply of the ore would be more abundantly and certainly furnished when to be drawn from the enterprise and the industry of the proprietor than under the present system the recommendations of the secretary in regard to the improvements of the western waters and certain prominent harbors on the lakes merit and i doubt not will receive your serious attention the great importance of these subjects to the prosperity of the extensive region referred to and the security of the whole country in time of war cannot escape observation the losses of life and property which annually occur in the navigation of the mississippi alone because of the dangerous obstructions in the river 
make a loud demand upon congress for the adoption of efficient measures for their removal the report of the secretary of the navy will bring you acquainted with that important branch of the public defenses considering the already vast and daily increasing commerce of the country apart from the exposure to hostile inroad of an extended seaboard all that relates to the navy is calculated to excite particular attention whatever tends to add to its efficiency without entailing unnecessary charges upon the treasury is well worth of your serious consideration it will be seen that while an appropriation exceeding by more than a million the appropriations of the current year is asked by the secretary yet that in this sum is proposed to be included four hundred thousand dollars for the purchase of clothing which when once expended will be annually reimbursed by the sale of the clothes and will thus constitute a perpetual fund without any new appropriation to the same object to this may also be added fifty thousand dollars asked to cover the arrearages of past years and two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in order to maintain a competent squadron on the coast of africa all of which when deducted will reduce the expenditures nearly within the limits of those of the current year while however the expenditures will thus remain very nearly the same as of the antecedent year it is proposed to add greatly to the operations of the marine and in lieu of only twenty-five ships in commission and but little in the way of building to keep with the same expenditure forty-one vessels afloat and to build twelve ships of a small class a strict system of accountability is established and great pains are taken to ensure industry fidelity and economy in every department of duty experiments have been instituted to test the quality of various materials particularly copper iron and coal as so to prevent fraud and imposition it will appear by the report of the postmaster general that the great point for which several years has been so much desired has during the current year been fully accomplished the expenditures of the department for current service have been brought within its income without lessening its general usefulness there has been an increase of revenue equal to one hundred and sixty six thousand dollars for the year eighteen forty two over that of eighteen forty one without as it is believed any addition having been made to the number of letters and newspapers transmitted through the mails the post office laws have been honestly administered and fidelity has been observed in accounting for and paying over by the subordinates of the department the monies which have been received for the details of the service i refer you to the report i flatter myself that the exhibition thus made of the condition of the public administration will serve to convince you that every proper attention has been paid to the interests of the country by those who have been called to the heads of the different departments the reduction in the annual expenditures of the government already accomplished furnishes a sure evidence that economy in the application of the public monies is regarded as a paramount duty at peace with all the world the personal liberty of the citizen sacredly maintained and his rights secured under political institutions deriving all their authority from the direct sanction of the people with a soil fertile almost beyond example and a country blessed with every diversity of climate and production what remains to be done in order to advance the happiness and prosperity of such a people under ordinary circumstances this inquiry could readily be answered the best that probably could be done for a people inhabiting such a country would be to fortify their peace and security in the prosecution of their various pursuits by guarding them against invasion from without and violence from within the rest for the greater part 
might be left to their own energy and enterprise. The chief embarrassments which at the moment exhibit themselves have arisen from overaction, and the most difficult task which remains to be accomplished is that of correcting and overcoming its effects. Between the years 1833 and 1838, additions were made to bank capital and bank issues in the form of notes designed for circulation to an extent enormously great. The question seemed not to be how the best currency could be provided, but in what manner the greatest amount of bank paper could be put into circulation. Thus, a vast amount of what was called money, since for the time being it answered the purposes of money, was thrown upon the country. An over-issue which was attended as a necessary consequence by an extravagant increase of the prices of all articles of property, the spread of a speculative mania all over the country, and has finally ended in a general indebtedness on the part of states and individuals, the prostration of public and private credit, a depreciation in the market value of real and personal estate, and has left large districts of country almost entirely without any circulating medium. In the view of the fact that in 1830 the whole banknote circulation within the United States amounted to but $61,323,898, according to the Treasury statements, and that an addition had been made thereto of the enormous sum of $88 million in seven years, the circulation on the 1st of January, 1837, being stated at $149,185,890, aided by the great facilities afforded in obtaining loans from European capitalists who were seized with the same speculative mania which prevailed in the United States, and the large importations of funds from abroad, the result of stock sales and loans, no one can be surprised at the apparent but unsubstantial state of prosperity which everywhere prevailed over the land. And as little cause of surprise should be felt at the present prostration of everything and the ruin which has befallen so many of our fellow citizens in the sudden withdrawal from circulation of so large an amount of bank issues since 1837, exceeding, as is believed, the amount added to the paper currency for a similar period antecedent to 1837, it ceases to be a matter of astonishment that such extensive shipwreck should have been made of private fortunes, or that difficulties should exist in meeting their engagements on the part of the debtor states, apart from which, if there be taken into account the immense losses sustained in the dishonor of numerous banks, it is less a matter of surprise that insolvency should have visited many of our fellow citizens than that so many should have escaped the blighting influences of the times. In the solemn conviction of these truths, and with an ardent desire to meet the pressing necessities of the country, I feel it to be my duty to cause to be submitted to you at the commencement of your last session, the plan of an exchequer, the whole power and duty of maintaining which, in purity and vigor, was to be exercised by the representatives of the people and the states, and therefore virtually by the people themselves. It was proposed to place it under the control and direction of a treasury board, to consist of three commissioners, whose duty it should be to see that the law of its creation was faithfully executed and that the great end of supplying a paper medium of exchange at all times convertible into gold and silver should be attained. The board thus constituted was given as much permanency as could be imparted to it without endangering the proper share of responsibility which should attach to all public agents. In order to ensure all the advantages of a well-matured experience, the commissioners were to hold their offices for the respective periods of two, four, and six years, thereby securing at all times 
in the management of the exchequer the services of two men of experience and to place them in a condition to exercise perfect independence of mind and action it was provided that their removal should only take place for actual incapacity or infidelity to the trust and to be followed by the president with an exposition of the causes of such removal should it occur it was proposed to establish subordinate boards in each of the states under the same restrictions and limitations of the power of removal which with the central board should receive safely keep and disperse the public monies and in order to furnish a sound paper medium of exchange the exchequer should retain of the revenues of the government a sum not to exceed five million dollars in specie to be set apart as required by its operations and to pay the public creditor at his own option either in specie or treasury notes of denominations not less than five dollars nor exceeding one hundred dollars which notes should be redeemed at the several places of issue and to be receivable at all times and everywhere in payment of government dues with a restraint upon such issue of bills that the same should not exceed the maximum of fifteen million dollars in order to guard against all the hazards incident to fluctuations in trade the secretary of the treasury was invested with authority to issue five million dollars of government stock should the same at any time be regarded as necessary in order to place beyond hazard the prompt redemption of the bills which might be thrown into circulation thus in fact making the issue of fifteen million dollars of exchequer bills rest substantially on ten million dollars and keeping in circulation never more than one and one half dollars for every dollar in specie when to this it is added that the bills are not only everywhere receivable in government dues but that the government itself would be bound for their ultimate redemption no rational doubt can exist that the paper which the exchequer would furnish would readily enter into general circulation and be maintained at all times at or above par with gold and silver thereby realizing the great want of the age and fulfilling the wishes of the people in order to reimburse the government the expenses of the plan it was proposed to invest the exchequer with the limited authority to deal in bills of exchange unless prohibited by the state in which an agency might be situated having only thirty days to run and resting on a fair and bona fide basis the legislative will on this point might be so plainly announced as to avoid all pretext for partiality or favoritism it was furthermore proposed to invest this treasury agent with authority to receive on deposit to a limited amount the specie funds of individuals and to grant certificates therefore to be redeemed on presentation under the idea which is believed to be well founded that such certificates would come in aid of the exchequer bills in supplying a safe and ample paper circulation or if in place of the contemplated dealings in exchange the exchequer should be authorized not only to exchange its bills for actual deposits of specie but for specie or its equivalent to sell drafts charging therefore a small but reasonable premium i cannot doubt but that the benefits of the law would be speedily manifested in the revival of the credit trade and business of the whole country entertaining this opinion it becomes my duty to urge its adoption upon congress by reference to the strongest considerations of the public interests with such alterations in its details as congress may in its wisdom see fit to make i am well aware that this proposed alteration and amendment of the laws establishing the treasury department has encountered various objections and that among others it has been proclaimed a government bank of fearful and dangerous import it is proposed to confer upon it no extraordinary power it purports to do no more than pay the debts of the government with the redeemable paper of the government 
in which respect it accomplishes precisely what the treasury does daily at this time in issuing to the public creditors the treasury notes which under law it is authorized to issue it has no resemblance to an ordinary bank as it furnishes no profit to private stockholders and lends no capital to individuals if it be objected to as a government bank and the objection be available then should all the laws in relation to the treasury be repealed and the capacity of the government to collect what is due to it or pay what it owes be abrogated this is the chief purpose of the proposed exchequer and surely if in the accomplishment of a purpose so essential it affords a sound circulating medium to the country and facilitates to trade it should be regarded as no slight recommendation of it to public consideration properly guarded by the provisions of the law it can run into no dangerous evil nor can any abuse arise under it but such as the legislature itself will be answerable for it if it be tolerated since it is but the creature of the law and is susceptible at all times of modification amendment or repeal at the pleasure of congress i know that it has been objected that the system would be liable to be abused by the legislature by whom alone it could be abused in the party conflicts of the day that such abuse would manifest itself in a change of the law which would authorize an excessive issue of paper for the purpose of inflating prices and winning popular favor to that it may be answered that the ascription of such a motive to congress is altogether gratuitous and inadmissible the theory of our institutions would lead us to a different conclusion but a perfect security against a proceeding so reckless would be found to exist in the very nature of things the political party which should be so blind to the true interests of the country as to resort to such an expedient would inevitably meet with final overthrow and the fact that the moment the paper ceased to be convertible into specie or otherwise promptly redeemed it would become worthless and would in the end dishonor the government involve the people in ruin and such political party in hopeless disgrace at the same time such a view involves the utter impossibility of furnishing any currency other than that of the precious metals for if the government itself cannot forego the temptation of excessive paper issues what reliance can be placed in corporations upon whom the temptations of individual aggrandizement would most strongly operate the people would have to blame none but themselves for any injury that might arise from a course so reckless since their agents would be the wrongdoers and they the passive spectators there can be but three kinds of public currency first gold and silver second the paper of state institutions or third a representative of the precious metals provided by the general government or under its authority the sub-treasury system rejected the last in any form and as it was believed that no reliance could be placed on the issues of local institutions for the purposes of general circulation it necessarily and unavoidably adopted specie as the exclusive currency for its own use and this must ever be the case unless one of the other kinds be used the choice in the present state of public sentiment lies between an exclusive specie currency on the one hand and government issues of some kind on the other that these issues cannot be made by a chartered institution is supposed to be conclusively settled they must be made then directly by government agents for several years past they have been thus made in the form of treasury notes and have answered a valuable purpose their usefulness has been limited by their being transient and temporary their ceasing to bear interest at given periods necessarily causes their speedy return and thus restricts their range of circulation and being used 
only in the disbursements of government, they cannot reach those points where they are most required. By rendering their use permanent, to the moderate extent already mentioned, by offering no inducement for their return, and by exchanging them for coin and other values, they will constitute to a certain extent the general currency, so much needed to maintain the internal trade of the country. And this is the exchequer plan, so far as it may operate, in furnishing a currency. I cannot forego the occasion to urge its importance to the credit of the government in a financial point of view. The great necessity of resorting to every proper and becoming expedient in order to place the Treasury on a footing of the highest respectability is entirely obvious. The credit of the government may be regarded as the very soul of the government itself, a principle of vitality without which all its movements are languid and all its operations embarrassed. In this spirit, the executive felt itself bound by the most imperative sense of duty to submit to Congress at its last session the propriety of making a specific pledge of the land fund as the basis of the negotiation of the loans authorized to be contracted. I then thought that such an application of the public domain would without doubt have placed at the command of the government ample funds to relieve the Treasury from the temporary embarrassments under which it labored. American credit had suffered a considerable shock in Europe, from the large indebtedness of the states and the temporary inability of some of them to meet the interests on their debts. The utter and disastrous prostration of the United States Bank of Pennsylvania had contributed largely to increase the sentiment of distrust by reason of the loss and ruin sustained by the holders of its stock, a large portion of whom were foreigners, and many of whom were alike ignorant of our political organization and of our actual responsibilities. It was the anxious desire of the executive that in the effort to negotiate the loan abroad, the American negotiator might be able to point the moneylender to the fund mortgaged for the redemption of the principal and interest of any loan he might contract, and thereby vindicate the government from all suspicion of bad faith or inability to meet its engagements. Congress differed from the executive in this view of the subject, it became nevertheless the duty of the executive to resort to every expedient in its power to do so. After a failure in the American market, a citizen of high character and talent was sent to Europe with no better success, and thus the mortifying spectacle has been presented of the inability of this government to obtain a loan so small as not in the whole to amount to more than one-fourth of its ordinary annual income at a time when the governments of Europe, although involved in debt and with their subjects heavily burdened with taxation, readily obtained loans of any amount at a greatly reduced rate of interest. It would be unprofitable to look further into this anomalous state of things, but I cannot conclude without adding that for a government which has paid off its debts of two wars with the largest maritime power of Europe, and now, owing a debt which is almost next to nothing when compared with its boundless resources, a government the strongest in the world, because emanating from the popular will and firmly rooted in the affections of a great and free people, and whose fidelity to its engagements has never been questioned, for such a government to have tendered to the capitalists of other countries an opportunity for a small investment in its stock, and yet to have failed, implies either the most unfounded distrust in its good faith, or a purpose to obtain which the course pursued is the most fatal which could have been adopted. It has now become obvious to all men that the government must look to its own means for supplying its wants and it is consoling to know that these means are altogether adequate for the object. 
the exchequer if adopted will greatly aid in bringing about this result upon what i regard as a well-rounded supposition that its bills would be readily sought for by the public creditors and that the issue would in a short time reach the maximum of fifteen million dollars it is obvious that ten million dollars would thereby be added to the available means of the treasury without cost or charge nor can i fail to urge the great and beneficial effects which would be produced in aid of all the active pursuits of life its effects upon the solvent state banks while it would force into liquidation those of an opposite character through its weekly settlements would be highly beneficial and with the advantages of a sound currency the restoration of confidence and credit would follow with a numerous train of blessings my convictions are most strong that these benefits would flow from the adoption of this measure but if the result should be adverse there is this security in connection with it that the law creating it may be repealed at the pleasure of the legislature without the slightest implication of its good faith i recommend to congress to take into consideration the propriety of reimbursing a fine imposed on general jackson at new orleans at the time of the attack and defense of that city and paid by him without designing any reflection on the judicial tribunal which imposed the fine the remission at this day may be regarded as not unjust or inexpedient the voice of the civil authority was heard amidst the glitter of arms and obeyed by those who held the sword thereby giving additional lustre to a memorable military achievement if the laws were offended their majesty was fully vindicated and although the penalty incurred and paid is worthy of little regard in a pecuniary point of view it can hardly be doubted that it would be gratifying to the war-worn veteran now in retirement and in the winter of his days to be relieved from the circumstances in which that judgment placed him there are cases in which public functionaries may be called on to weigh the public interest against their own personal hazards and if the civil law be violated from praiseworthy motives or an overruling sense of public danger and public necessity punishment may well be restrained within that limit which asserts and maintains the authority of the law and the subjection of the military to the civil power the defence of new orleans while it saved a city from the hands of the enemy placed the name of general jackson among those of the greatest captains of the age and illustrated one of the brightest pages of our history now that the causes of excitement existing at the time have ceased to operate it is believed that the remission of this fine and whatever of gratification that remission might cause the eminent man who incurred and paid it would be in accordance with the general feeling and wishes of the american people i have thus fellow-citizens acquitted myself of my duty under the constitution by laying before you as succinctly as i have been able the state of the union and by inviting your attention to measures of much importance to the country the executive will most zealously unite its efforts with those of the legislative department in the accomplishment of all that is required to relieve the wants of a common constituency or elevate the destinies of a beloved country end of section thirteen